an urban legend. Some legends are too horrible to be true. Others are too horrific to be invented. Early spring, decades ago. Sheriff's deputies swarmed the scene like an army of ants, dismantling some long abandoned picnic lunch. Some were setting up lights to replace the disappearing sunlight. Others were carrying small plastic bags and jars, along with collection tools to various places in the campsite. Still others were taking pictures of placeholder cards with numbers on them set next to assorted types of evidence, then recording the number on a sheet of paper and describing each piece of evidence the placeholder represented. A new cruiser pulled into the campsite. Like many of the others, it bore the county seal and the words Warden County Sheriff's Deputy. The occupant pulled the car to a stop and took in the activity before him. There was a small RV campsite suitable for six recreational vehicles. There were cement pads where the RVs could park, and each pad provided water and sewage hookups. In addition to this, there were picnic tables and fire pits, along with intermittent patches of gravel. For most people, this was nothing like camping. But for those who were both wealthy enough to pay for an RV and spoiled enough to require a window through which to view nature, this was roughing it. As he watched the deputies crawling over the scene, the sheriff reckoned that no one who camped with an RV could ever have any real understanding of the wilderness or nature. But the sheriff was a good old boy raised on hunting, fishing, and backroading. People from his corner of the world viewed wealthy young liberals as vacuous degenerates with a moral deficiency propped up by too much money and not enough common sense. Just as those same liberals viewed people like the sheriff as being close-minded, dull-witted simpletons who spat tobacco, picked their noses in public, and prided themselves on making it all the way to the sixth grade. In another decade, as he entered the age of itis, bursitis, arthritis, tendonitis, gastritis, and all other middle-aged maladies ending in itis, he would come to appreciate the benefits of an RV in the middle of nowhere. A tall, lanky deputy approached the car, and the sheriff stepped out and greeted him. Clay, he said to the man he'd known first as his friend. Ben Cooper and Clay Hollister had been friends since grade school. They were two of a kind, destined for police work from the very beginning. On the playground, they took turns reeling in would-be bullies. They were the boys in high school who took it upon themselves to redirect kids who were heading down the wrong road and setting them back on the right path. It was only natural that these two would head straight to the state-sponsored police academy upon graduation. When they returned, they were both immediately hired as deputies by the Warden County Sheriff's Department. Here is where their personalities led them down different roads. Ben Cooper had always been the leader. He was the man who made the big decisions, accepted the responsibility, and handled the consequences of actions taken under his direction. It was only a matter of time before he would throw his hat in the arena and run for sheriff. Meanwhile, Clayton Hollister thrived on the details that others would find tedious, but for him answered all the questions in the universe. Forensics was his natural inclination. Solving the puzzles and finding the answers were his great reward. That he lived in a small town where forensics was rarely needed only served to sharpen his desire to comb through every detail when the occasion did arise. What do we got? Ben asked his friend. Clay led him to the first body. A parent animal attack, Sheriff, he said, subconsciously sliding into a more formal style of conversation. Looks like a family camping trip. The husband is over there on the ground, most of them anyway. My guess is the boy was running to get inside the camper when he was attacked from behind. We'll have to turn him over to confirm that. The dad must have tried to fight off whatever attacked the kid and then been attacked himself. The two men now stood over the body of a young boy, approximately 8 to 10 years of age. He was lying outside what had once been the door of the RV, just as Clay had suggested, as though he had been running to get inside when he was hit. His face smeared with blood and pieces of intestine stared up at them in terrified shock. His mouth opened in an eternal silent scream. Ben pulled a handkerchief out of his back pocket and held it under his nose to block the smell of death. 
The boy's arms were spread out from his body like the wings of a bird halted in mid-flight. One leg was bent backward under his body, while the other leg laid out at a straight angle from his hip. His torso had been ripped open and his peritoneal cavity had been emptied onto the ground around him. I suspect we'll find marks on his back confirming the attack from behind, Clay said as Ben gazed down at the twisted, mangled boy at his feet. He died slowly, Ben surmised. The thought was enough to physically push him backward. He felt the world spin for a moment as he fought to gather himself. When you're ready, we'll look at the father, Clay whispered to his friend. Ben looked at him with a mix of mild confusion and gratitude. I've been here a while, Ben. I've had time to adjust, he said gently. Ben nodded his head, took a deep breath, then moved over to the father's body lying at the front end of the RV. Like I said, the boy was probably trying to get inside the camper when he was attacked, Clay said as they walked, but he didn't make it. They reached the second body, which was also on its back. Like the boy, his stomach had been ripped open and his intestines were pulled out and scattered around. Make note of the position of the arms and hands on this one, Ben, Clay said, referring to the fact that the man's hands were at his side. And look at the drag marks, he added, pointing to the trail that led from the man's heels to a spot closer to the boy. It looks like he was coming to his son's rescue when he was attacked and either killed outright or knocked unconscious. Then he was dragged here where he was eaten. Ben shut his eyes and pushed away another wave of nausea. The head? he asked. Don't know, Clay answered. Haven't found it yet. Jesus. It was meant to be a whisper, but it came out as a hiss. Take your time, Ben. There's a lot to take in here. Are you sure this was an animal attack? Is there any chance this might be some sick maniac in action? Ben wasn't really questioning Clay's detective skills. He just needed to verbally work it out in his own mind. Could be human, but how many people do you know could pull someone's head off? Clay kneeled down next to the body to make his argument, taking a pen from his shirt as he did so. Look at the jagged edges on the neck. These are tears, not an incision. He used the pen as a pointer as he described the wound. This head was not cut off. See the spine? He ran the pen along the exposed interconnecting bone, making sure to exaggerate the unnatural curvature. It's been jerked on. See how it extends unnaturally out of the neck and sort of twists? Something got a hold of this guy, twisted and pulled and popped his head right off his body. I don't know of any human strong enough to do that, do you? He looked up at the sheriff for confirmation, but saw only a man about to lose his lunch. He put his pen back in his pocket and said, and then there's this. He stood up and led Ben over to the edge of the woods where the number nine place card sat alone. Next to it was a massive canine footprint. This time it was the sheriff who knelt, placing his hand on the ground next to the enormous footprint he was shocked to realize just how small his fist was by comparison. Bear? he asked. Nope, definitely canine. I just don't know what kind of canine could leave such a huge print. We don't have wolves in this area, I know. Coyotes don't get that big, I know. A dog? Maybe. Thing is, dragging isn't canine behavior. And you're sure it's not a bear? I'm sure. Besides, Ben... When was the last time anyone saw a bear in this area? Ben stood up and looked around at the two bodies. Is this it? he asked. No, there's one more body inside the camper. Clay pointed at the RV as he spoke. Ben followed his direction with his eyes and stopped to take another deep breath. Well, let's have a look-see. Slowly, he trudged towards the doorway of the camper, careful not to step in the boys' entrails, or to even look at the tragic expression on his young face. What had once been a door was peeled open like a sardine can. Something large had gotten inside that RV. Ben shuddered at the thought of what it could be. Clay, someone called from the edge of the woods. We found the head. The matter-of-fact statement lost its potency as the words faltered in the speaker's throat. I'll be with you in a minute, Clay told Ben before shifting direction to go examine the newfound item. Inside the camper, more deputies busied themselves with collecting evidence and recording the scene. Ben looked around questioningly, 
One of the deputies, surmising his need, pointed towards a divider that separated the sleeping area from the eating area of the vehicle. A bloody handprint on a panel of the door sill pointed the way. Girding himself for what he was about to see, Ben stepped through. On the bed was a woman. Like her husband and son, she'd been gutted. She lay on her back with her legs draped over the side of the bed, her intestines falling down between her legs in a waterfall of blood, internal organs, and feces. The smell was a violent blow that forced Sheriff Cooper into a backward step before he was able to balance himself and fully grasp the scene. Dear God, he exclaimed. She looks like she's given birth to herself. He was instantly humiliated by his momentary lack of professionalism, but this was more than he'd ever seen. He was struggling to maintain his composure. In stark contrast to Ben Cooper's dismay, two deputies worked to gather evidence from her body. One was photographing a missing fingernail on her left hand, while the other was scraping something from under the nails of the right. The woman's face lacked expression. Her mouth was shut, but blood dripped through her lips. One of the deputies handed a small jar of ointment to the sheriff and said, This'll help. Ben took the jar, twisted off the cap, scooped some of the menthol-scented cream onto his finger and rubbed it under his nose. He then moved in to get a closer look at the victim's face. The other deputy, seeing what the sheriff was looking at, said she apparently bit off her own tongue in the fight. Or something bit it off for her, Ben spat. Her face looks like she gave up. The boy looked terrified, but she kind of looks calm. Don't put too much importance on their facial expressions, Ben, Clay whispered quietly as he stepped into the room. Rigor mortis has a way of changing expressions to make people look more terrified, or as with this woman, less, than they might have been in life. The boy looked frightened. She looks calm. It's how it works. Ben let that sink in. He trusted everything Clay told him. He just needed a moment to allow himself to accept it. Forcing his eyes from the picture he would never forget, he walked over to a small built-in dresser and closet unit before asking, Is this it? Yes, Clay said with confidence. It appears to be just a mother, father, and their son. Ben slid open the top drawer while Clay continued. We're gathering all evidence to send to the lab, but I think we all know this is an animal attack. Ben pulled out a small piece of folded material as Clay continued to speak. At this point, it's just a matter of figuring out what kind of animal it is and how we're going to... The material in Ben's hand unfolded to reveal a sundress fit for a little girl, no more than two or three years of age. Clay stared at the dress a moment before locking eyes with Ben. Clay sprang into action, moving through the RV and then outside. He spoke with authority. We got trouble, boys and girls, he said as he walked. There's one missing, female, approximately two to four years of age. Spread out and search all surrounding areas. She may still be alive. The deputies stopped what they were doing and turned to listen to Clay. The organized chaos that had been a crime scene investigation now switched gears into a search and rescue party. Deputies went to their vehicles to remove rifles and flashlights. Clay pulled a map from his cruiser and placed it on a nearby picnic table. Everyone gathered around as he began to form a plan of attack. Inside, Ben, left standing alone in the bedroom, looked down into the closet side of the little built-in. A pile of clothing formed what could have been a nest wherein a small child might have been hidden. Claw marks and splintered wood told the story of how she had been discovered and extracted from the shelter. Ben looked from the closet to the small window and beyond to the flurry of deputies preparing to search for this child. He clutched the little dress and whispered, God help us all. <laughs>